Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to see you, except, of course, I can't really, some of you. Um, and uh, I'm not really uh, sitting outside by a river. I'm sitting in my home office. Uh, this is a, just a screenshot of the Des Plaines River behind me. And I hope that you find it comforting. Uh, it gets a little feel for outside. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about uh, uh, bird watching. I call this bird watching boot camp. It is really intended for uh, people with um, little or no experience with uh, watching birds. And um, I will take you through this. And it's uh, I've localized it to our immediate Glenview area. And I and I hope you enjoy it. And I certainly welcome. If you have questions, as uh, you're told, uh, type them into the chat, and we can address them uh, when we're done. So with that, let's uh, let's jump right into this and uh, see if we get this going. So each of you may have your own reason for why you're watching birds or why you would be interested in watching birds. Um, I'll give you a couple obvious ones that uh, seem to make a lot of sense to me and really are motivators for me. Um, first of all, watching birds is just a great, it's a great reason to get outside. And uh, when you're outside, it's a way to really connect to our natural environment. And while we're there, of course, birds themselves are just uh, beautiful animals. And uh, the nice thing is that they're almost everywhere. So you don't have to go too far uh, in too many different directions to look to find the birds um, that you want. Finding the birds that you actually want, though, uh, can sometimes be a challenge, but the birds are around. And then of course, when you're out uh, looking at birds and when you're out in nature, you begin to appreciate the value of our natural habitats. And then finally, one of the things that I find particularly appealing about bird watching and that it is, it is really, it's an intellectually stimulating thing. There's an awful lot to learn about birds, about our habitat uh, and about nature. And uh, birds is kind of the gateway drug to uh, learning all of those things. You can fill it in with your own particular reasons why you're interested in birds, but these are some of the reasons that I find are appealing. So when we think about uh, going to watching birds, one of the questions is, you know, where do we, where should we go to watch birds? And uh, it's common for people to think that, you know, I want to go someplace where I can see exotic birds and where I can see um, great habitat. And when I first started bird watching, I thought that I had to get on a plane, buy tickets and go to someplace distant. And cause I was looking to see some really unusual birds like these. So I'll just tell you what, what you're looking at here. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you've got a wood duck. Um, and in the center, uh, some of you may recognize this. This is the Harry Potter bird. It's the, it's the snowy owl. And in the upper right-hand corner, that's a black Bernian warbler. Uh, there's about 30 species of wildly colorful warblers. And this is one of the more colorful ones. And then on the lower left, you've got a bobolink. Uh, this is, we call this the bird that's wearing a tuxedo backwards. Um, and then next to uh, it is the little bib, black bib is an Eastern meadowlark. And then on the right is the woody woodpecker of woodpeckers. It's the pileated woodpecker. It's the largest American woodpecker. So, you know, if you want to see these really unusual species, you know, you got to get in your car, you've got to drive to some distant location, you've got to go all the way to Glenview. Seriously, these birds that I just showed you can be found roughly in that circle that I've drawn here. And I want to tell you a little bit why. Glenview is, and this isn't true of any place on the map, this is true of here, Glenview. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. The birds that you're interested in seeing are right at your doorstep. And in this presentation, I'm gonna take you through um, our, some of our backyard birds and then some of the local areas right in our, own, um, in, our own, in our own neighborhood that you can go see some of the birds that I've shown you and many more. So let's take a look at this. So why is Glenview uh, such an interesting place. So let's take a little, back up that map a little bit. That little red dot is centered on Glenview. And of course, you recognize the rest of this, right? This is um, uh, the North America. You see the Gulf of Mexico in the south. 
and then the Great Lakes here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna superimpose another map over this map. So what I've done here is I've uh, superimposed the Mississippi Flyway. Uh, the Mississippi Flyway is in fact an interstate highway uh, for birds. And, you know, uh, sometimes we who live in the Midwest are the butt of some jokes by people who talk about us being flyover country. Well, the truth is we are flyover country. Uh, and that is the birds fly over. They're flying from uh, far south to north in the northern migration and then back again. So let's talk a little bit about the flyway and then we'll zero back and go back to Glenview. So what we have here is uh, the green is the Mississippi Flyway. And as you can see from the map on the right, there's actually four flyways and you've got the, um, uh, but the center one, the green one uh, is about 40% of waterfowl and shorebirds uses that to travel from the boreal forests up in Canada, all the way down to Patagonia. Some of these birds fly thousands of miles in their in their in their um, in their migration, and many of them fly right over our heads uh, during the migration months. Um, so this is so this so this is why Glenview is such such an important area, and of course I don't just mean Glenview; I really mean the Chicago area. But let's take a look. Let's go back again to Glenview and look about this in a little bit more detail, and then we'll zero in on that specifically. So why am I talking about Glenview? Am I just flattering Glenview? No, I'm not flattering Glenview. What we have here on the left here, well, let's take it over here, on the left here, and by the way, as I'm looking away from you, I'm looking at my other screen, so it's a little bit odd if you're looking at me and wondering why I'm looking away. Uh, I'm looking away and I'm looking at the and pulling my cursor down the Des Plaines River Valley. And uh, that's a north-south route. You can see the green and the birds, of course, um, enjoy traveling along that. And then along here, you've got the Skokie River corridor. And of course, this big body of water. We love Lake Michigan. And the birds, though, don't particularly like to fly over Lake Michigan uh, because that's not particularly safe for them. So they'll hug the, the shoreline and they'll fly along here. And that's why I included this um, circle to include a little bit of the shoreline as well as the Des Plaines River because I wanted to be incorporate this entire area to show how Glenview is kind of centered on in the Mississippi Flyway where the birds fly over. So where do we go to, um, jumped over to that too, yes. Move it, let's get, move it back. There we go. So where do we go for our um, bird watching? Well, let's start in our backyard. Um, the nice fun thing about birding is that you don't have to even leave your backyard. You don't have to leave your kitchen window uh, to begin doing some birding. There's 41 million backyard birders in the United States. It's, uh, there, I mean, people all over the world, all over the country are looking out their windows and they're looking at birds and, and one of the reasons, of course, is that, you know, it's fun to look outside and to see uh, some interesting birds. And of course, it's easy. Uh, you can do it any time of year. And it's good to just learn if you're even if you're going to get out of your backyard. It's good to just see what's going on and learn how to um, learn the differences of different kinds of birds and learn the different parts of the birds. And of course, every once in a while, uh, you can get some surprises in your backyard. And so that's always a lot of fun uh, to see that. So if you are going to do backyard birding, let's talk about a few things that make backyard birding successful. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to that slide. One of the things I think is important is just to help you identify the birds that I'm, I've got pictures of. So you've got a Baltimore Oriole there, uh, sitting on a hummingbird feeder. No, it doesn't really belong there. It's one of the surprises. Uh, and then you have a, um, a ruby-throated hummingbird who's uh, interested in getting to the food, but of course is not going to bother that big bird while it's there. So that's what's going on. 
That's what's going on in this picture. So obviously, the first thing you're going to want to do if you want to have birds is you're going to want to feed them. Um, and birds, uh, different birds, eat different things. So what I'm showing you here is a couple different, um, um, a, a couple different types of feeders. Uh, in the upper left, um, you've got a couple different kinds of woodpeckers. Um, you've got a red-bellied woodpecker. I know it has a red head, but it is called a red-bellied woodpecker on the, on the left. And on the right of the left-hand corner picture, you have a downy woodpecker. And what they're eating is they're eating suet, which is basically rendered fat with seeds and nuts embedded in it. And they pick it out and they eat it in a little suet feeder. So uh, that's one. And in the, in the right-hand side, you have American goldfinch. Uh, and they like this thing called Niger seed. Uh, and, and if you are a gardener, if you plant sunflowers or have echinacea, they'll certainly eat the seeds from the flowers and you can attract birds naturally in that way. And then the more, uh, um, most people are familiar with the tube feeder and that just has plain old seed. And I'll say two things about this. First of all, this is uh, pictures I took in my backyard and you'll see this, um, this tube feeder hanging right by my kitchen window. And I've moved it. And one of the reasons I've moved it, and you can see here, you can see the reflection of the feeder in the window. Well, the birds can see that reflection also. And they have a chance of flying into this window and damaging themselves. So I've actually moved, even though um, the, the feeder being right near the window is convenient for me, uh, I was afraid that I, in fact, I had experience with birds actually bumping up against the window. Um, and, and we'll talk more about window collisions uh, later, but I did move the feeder away from that. But I'm getting away from the food source, just talking about the different kinds of food. So, not, so one size does not fit all. If you wanna attract different kinds of birds to your, um, to your yard, you wanna have different types of feeders. However, what you start with, well, I would say the tube feeder is probably the first one you would start with. And then there's an awful variety of, um, of quality uh, of, um, of seed. And, uh, and you can, you, uh, I recommend, even though some of the feed from places like um, Wild Birds Unlimited, I'm not pushing for them. I'm just saying some of the bird specialty shops will in fact serve a better quality of bird seed and tend to attract the birds more effectively. But I would say experimentation is always a good thing with everything and certainly with this hobby, that's true here. And the last point I would uh, leave you with about um, feeding birds and that is just keep in mind that you're not really feeding the birds, um, you're really attracting them. And the reason I say that is that people sometimes um, share with me how they get very anxious when they're gonna go away for a weekend and nobody's gonna be feeding their birds. And it's like, no, no, don't worry. The birds will take care of themselves. They always have. You're just attracting them to your backyard. So you don't have to worry about keeping those feeders filled all the time. You're not really feeding the birds. You are in fact, just attracting them. However, one thing that you can do for birds and it's really effective for um, your backyard and that is providing them some sort of water source. Um, no, this is not a big daiquiri uh, for birds. <laughs> this is, um, birds are really messy and they not only drink from this, but they actually get in there and they bathe in the same water they drink. And um, so it's really important that if you do in fact uh, provide water for the birds, uh, two things, one is uh, keep it clean and change that water frequently. Even if there's water in there, you change that water. And the second thing is that uh, as I've done here, it's always nice in the winter to have, to be able to put a, uh, some sort of heater uh, connected to the, to the water source. So it keeps it unfrozen. And this can be one of the most effective ways for attracting birds to your, to your, to your backyard. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, backyard uh, birding and, uh, and the various food sources. Um, first of all, uh, not the food sources, rather the environments. So this is, again, uh, I've got, this is my backyard. Um, there's a small area that I've, and it's a really small area that I've naturalized. And what this does is if you put your feeder out um, and you're near some bushes, not too close, but near some bushes, 
Um, this is a great opportunity to give, provide some protection uh, in some nesting material, some food sources. So having a bird feeder out in an area uh, where the birds can quickly move away in case uh, they are threatened by anything that might um, come around them. And um, so what are those things that could come around them? Well, whoop, let's get back to that. I call these guys party poopers. Uh, here you've got a Cooper's hawk. You can see again, uh, take a picture taken on my own backyard. You can see my barbecue grill and the Cooper's hawk is just sitting there. And on the right-hand picture, you can see the various bird feeders that I have. And you can see that the Cooper's hawk has just planted itself um, right at the base of it. Obviously, uh, the birds have fled and where they've gone is they've gone into that bush and bramble in the back or further away, and they won't come back because they know that this is a predator and uh, they'll stay away. But it's great to be able to give them a place to go uh, when these predators come around. And I just want to say one more word about these, these guys. Here, and, and here's a coyote hanging out at the bottom of my bird feeder. Um, and yes, this is nature. Uh, I don't subscribe to the um, uh, Bambi concept of wildlife. Uh, this is real life. And, you know, coyotes and, uh, and, and Cooper's hawks, they're probably in your neighborhood. They're in your yard anyway. You may not notice them. Um, but uh, so you're not, you're not really doing anything different by putting out these feeders uh, are attracting them, you should just really be aware that uh, this is all part of the natural environment and um, be prepared for that. Okay, so what are you gonna see in your backyard? Um, well, let's take a look at these guys. Uh, here is a Baltimore Oriole uh, at a little uh, water feature. And I put up on the, a picture of the Baltimore Oriole baseball team's uniform um, I thought you'd like to see just the color, the color connection. I actually went and looked at it, so it looked at the sides and the beak and the collar and compared it to the, sh and to the coloration. I thought the coloring was very similar. I just thought it was kind of kind of cute to, to see the, what the team looked like, the team colors versus the actual Baltimore Oriole. And then the background um, of this picture, you've got a rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, this is a perfectly named bird, uh, first of all, the gross beak is, simply means large beak. He's given us a great, and by the way, it is a he. Uh, the female looks different. So the, 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 the gross beak is giving us a profile and he looks just fine. Uh, you can see that big beak. And then that rose breast uh, just is this absolutely marvelous red color that looks like somebody spilled uh, red ink on him. And then is this dribble down his breast. And he's kind of waiting his turn or just hanging out there. So last year, as the uh, pandemic um, settled on us, and we were all kind of like bummed out because our field trips and our and other programs were being canceled, uh, what we decided to do was have a, a an amateur backyard photo contest. So these are pictures taken by people uh, through their windows uh, of the birds in their backyard, and I've just got a few pictures that I'd like to show you. Oh, so, Sonny, can, Sonny, can I interrupt for a second? Please. Before we get too far away from the bird feeders, we did have a question about how to keep rats and squirrels uh, away from the bird feeders and the bird feeders. Right, feeders. right. So you'll see here on these, do you see those baffles that I've got up there? So these kinds of things uh, are, are specifically intended to keep, um, I don't think uh, rats are going to be too much of a problem, but certainly squirrels, I mean, they're incredible. And they'll climb right up this pole, right underneath that baffle. So you do need those baffles. And again, um, you can find these things at the, at the hardware store. You can find them at those uh, bird specialty shops and they'll equip you with those, with that kind of equipment. That's a good question. Thank you. I'm glad that you interrupted so I could have that slide ready for you. Okay, a couple pictures of the birds, if I can go on there. Other questions, are we good? Okay. So again, some of the things you're gonna see in your, you could see in your backyard, uh, in the upper left, this guy is a cedar waxwing. 
uh, is a very elegant looking bird. If you're really lucky, you're gonna get some nesting birds. We've got some baby robins in the nest. Uh, and then we've got a red-headed woodpecker. You may remember a few moments ago, I talked about a red-bellied woodpecker and pointed out that yes, it did have a red head, but this is truly the red-headed woodpecker. And uh, it's great to see birds like these because this is a actually a threatened species. That is, the quantity of these birds is diminishing and that's a problem. So certainly providing cover and habitat and food uh, for these kinds of, uh, particularly the threatened birds, only, only the red-headed woodpecker in these pictures is, um, is, is um, threatened. And of course, you can clearly see that these are backyard birding pictures. Uh, here we have another woodpecker on the left. This is a northern flicker um, sitting again on a suet feeder. And in the right, here's a Baltimore Oriole again. Wrong color, right? Well, this is the female Baltimore Oriole. And when I said earlier that I said that birding is intellectually stimulating and there's surprises, you know, this is really what I was referring to, that you come to learn a bird like the Baltimore Oriole, and then you all of a sudden you see a, a bird like this and go like, what the heck is that bird? And it turns out that it is simply the same Baltimore Oriole, except it's the female species. So you begin to learn the variations of the bird. It can be very, very uh, fun. So we're gonna leave the backyard now because we've got other places to go. But people ask me, you know, what is the most unusual bird that has come to my yard? So you can see here, this is a black-billed cuckoo. This bird does not belong in my yard. It is a forest bird. Um, and when I said again at the top of this presentation that backyard birding, you're gonna get some surprises. And this was one of the surprises it was such a surprise that I had no idea what it was. I actually looked at it and my wife who was a much better birder than I am. I just like, uh, and we both work from the home. And uh, I said to her, there's a bird of interest in the backyard, come and look at it. And she identified as a, as a, as a black-billed cuckoo. The, the bird was very cooperative. Uh, it was resting. It probably just migrated and was tired. So it just sat there and I was really able to take a lot of, um, shots of this thing. Anyway, so that's backyard birding. Let's, but you know, so let's, let's leave the backyard and let's go birding. And before we do, I wanna run a little clinic for you. And that is on um, how to look for birds. I call that watching, uh, what to wear and what to carry. And we'll run through this pretty quickly, but I want to, I want to uh, touch base on this stuff because before we, you know, in, the, in our homes, we don't have to worry too much about clothing or, or carrying anything with us or anything. We're, we're home and it's real comfortable. But when you get, get outside, you wanna be a little bit more prepared. So think through these things. We're watching the only piece of equipment that I really think is imperative to have if you're gonna leave the backyard and go out birding and that is binoculars. And a lot of people have these uh, small opera glasses, um, and I really discourage that because frankly, you're gonna have a bad experience. So if you have a bad experience, you won't come back and go birding again. Now, I don't wanna be snobbish. I've got, I've got this picture of these Nikon binoculars. You don't need to be Nikons. They don't have to be expensive. What they have to be is they should be, in, um, you've got two measures on a binocular. One is uh, the magnification, uh, and I recommend an eight power binocular. And the second thing is the brightness and the size of the optic, the size of this lens, this is a 42 millimeter lens, is what determines how much light gets in, which determines how effectively you can actually see the bird. So getting a pair of binoculars is the one piece of equipment. And when I say that every person, if you go with other people, every person should have their own binoculars because you know the birds just don't sit still. So you can't look at a bird and then hand your binoculars off to somebody else so they can look at the bird because by then, who knows where the bird has gone. So you really wanna have a pair of binoculars with you at the ready so that you can use them. Sonny, we had a question about binoculars in the beginning. Um, I know you mentioned Nikon, is that a particularly uh, um, expensive kind or a particularly good quality? Uh, yeah, I just actually just stole this uh, this picture off the internet. Uh, <laughs> 
there was nothing I was recommending about this. There's a whole variety. Uh, uh, Nikons are good binoculars, but I, uh, there's a number of different features. Uh, of course, time doesn't permit us to really have a clinic on binoculars, but um, there's a lot of things that you can decide. That's why I really focused on getting an eight power binocular for beginners. It's okay to start with an inexpensive pair. And then if you find that you're really into it, uh, you, can, you can simply begin replacing binoculars with another pair of binoculars. I give you permission to own two pair of binoculars. Okay, thanks, Sonny. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And of course, if you had a moment to look at the, at the, the slide on clothing, um, look more importantly maybe look at look at look at the picture look what people are wearing um so you see people here they've got they've got uh, overcoats some people are carrying backpacks uh, generally when we go bird watching we start out early in the morning it tends to be cooler the day warms up you're wearing all that heavier stuff you want to take it off and start discarding it you put it into the backpack and keep going a lot of people show up in the field um, with gym shoes and it's the, 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 um, the grass is moist that you're walking on, your feet get wet, and then you spend the next uh, hour or two walking around in wet feet, you have a bad experience. So you should think through some of your clothing options and I've got the list here. And you know, pants to me is one of the more important things. Uh, you'll see that everybody's got long pants. Um, simply to avoid, you're gonna may walk past from, from some uh, bushes you don't want to get scratched. You may have some bugs. You don't want to get bit. So um, uh, wearing, simply giving some thought to the right uh, clothing. You don't have to go to the outfitter. You don't have to find anything too um, uh, expensive or weird. You just have to think through wearing, uh, wearing, wearing some of the right stuff. And then what are you going to carry with you? Well, I already talked about binoculars. Uh, a field guide is simply something that helps you um, uh, identify if you don't have good birders surrounding you, telling you what you're looking at, uh, which is what I rely on, but which, uh, but in that we'll talk more about uh, working with other birders. And of course, water is an important thing. Uh, having some sunscreen and, and bug repellent, first aid is an option for you. You're really not probably gonna go too far out into the bush as it were. You'll be in a more public area. We'll look at some of those places in a moment. Um, having some snacks or candy bars or something that you like to eat that gives you a nuts are great. Um, in the middle of the of the morning that you can simply so you don't get too hungry. And then, you know, lip balm, same thing with the sunscreen, those kinds of things. Again, it's a quick uh, checklist. And really what I'm saying is not so much this is the checklist as much as that you should simply think through a little bit rather than showing up um, and going like, oh, gee, uh, I really should have brought a hat or something like that. By the way, I said no uh, no uh, uh, shorts as a rule, but of course you see that uh, uh, one of my favorite friends here, uh, he comes to everything in shorts. And uh, so he's you, you come how you're comfortable. Some people have walking sticks. Uh, so whatever, and you can see that the terrain in many of the areas that uh, we go in is uh, is level, and you can walk on it. Although it's still uh, cinder, or it's um, it's uh, it's it's basically not paved. Uh, we will talk about that because we're going to talk about some uh, handicap accessible areas in a moment. Okay, so when you get out of your backyard and you know, you've got all those feeders there, uh, the most uh, significant determinant for what kind of birds you're gonna see is the habitat you go to. And we're really, really fortunate here in Glenview because we've got a number of habitats that give us variety that attract different kinds of birds. So we'll do a, a little quick run through to look at some of these birds and see uh, some of these areas rather, and see what kind of birds we're, we're, we, we, can, we can see. For uh, We're gonna look at grasslands uh, and we're gonna look at wetlands. For that, we're gonna go visit uh, uh, Kent Fuller Air Station Prairie. And then for forest land, we're gonna take a look at the grove and we'll discuss those a little bit more in a moment. And for, then for lakes and streams, we'll take a look at Lake Glenview. These are areas that chances are, um, many of you are already familiar with. Um, if you're not, you should go there, whether you're birding or not. They're absolutely marvelous areas to visit. But let's take a moment 
and, 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 and look at these areas. All right, so for prairie and wetland, uh, I chose Air Station Prairie. Um, um, the Evelyn Peace Tyner Interpretive Center is right on this property. Uh, it's right on Compass Road at Lehigh by the, by the Metro, Metro Railroad uh, tracks and uh, in, in the, out, outside the Glen. And uh, I went there about five, six years ago and there was this old, well, old woman um, sweeping up right there, I think right when I was taking this picture. And I engaged her in a conversation and it turned out to be um, Evelyn P. Steiner uh, right there sweeping up the, in front. And we talked for a little bit. Um, when I went to do research for this, I learned that she'd, I actually passed away probably shortly after I'd taken this picture. Um, she was 95 years old. So, but this is a great area to go visit. And we're gonna see a number of birds um, in this area. Let's take a look at some of them. So this is the interpretive center. And this is maybe a little bit better picture. I'm actually standing on compass on the sidewalk on Compass Road here, uh, looking north. Um, and you can see the wetlands in the, in the foreground and you can see the prairie lands uh, further, further back. Uh, and you can see uh, the interpretive center offers a little boardwalk around it. Uh, so it's easy to gain access to this area. Now I'm again standing on the boardwalk. So what we are, and I'm gonna set this scene here a little bit. This is an evening bird walk. Most bird walks are in fact in the morning. Um, that's when the birds are most active. But the birds we came to see in this area are active in the evening. It's actually darker now than it looks. I uh, brightened this up a bit and we're walking out uh, from the interpretive center out into the um, area. This is uh, sometime in uh, early April. And what we're going to see there are these two birds. Pretty strange birds looking. Uh, the one on the top is a uh, common snipe and the one on the bottom which you can barely determine from its background is an American woodcock. And these are just fun birds to see. You can see uh, right away, these are not birds you would expect to be see at your feeder. Uh, the common snipe with its long beak, yeah, it's in, you can see the environment that it likes. Uh, it's got a little bit in a, a very shallow water, uh, muddy areas, and then it uses that beak to uh, dig down and find insects and anthropods and other things. So that's what it likes to eat and it just, gobbles them up with that long, with that long bill. And then the American woodcock, a uh, similar environment, and it has that long bill as well. And it is a very ungainly looking bird. So I wanna just take a moment because I said that we were walking out into the field here and you're gonna say, well, what were you walking out into the field to? And the answer is we were there in early April to see an, a very fascinating um, mating ritual uh, of the American woodcock. And so here's another picture. Uh, this was not taken actually at, um, at Air Station Prairie, but here we were gathered again, you can see it's a very dark picture and we were gathered here. And what we're doing is we're listening to the woodcock just making a little bit of sound. And then all of a sudden the bird shoots up into the sky. I call it like a bottle rocket bird. It just shoots up in the sky. Um, you try and see it and it begins to make noise and it begins to do this aerial display, uh, basically attracting the female that remains uh, on the ground. And then it, and then it um, flies down and again, begins calling again. And it does this for a couple hours. Of course, it gets too dark to see anything, but uh, in early April at Air Station Prairie, going out into that prairie, um, if you ever go, uh, maybe you'll join us uh, sometime when we're out there, when we can get together um, and, and not be all masked up, um, we, can, we can enjoy this together. It is really an experience to have to see this American woodcock. So that's uh, one part of um, Air Station Prairie. A second bird that we see here in the wetland, uh, and this is a, a Virginia rail uh, on the top. It looks like a little, kind of like a chicken, um, 
I don't think it's related to the chicken family, but it's it's a it's a, a part of the rail family. And then uh, again, we were here a little bit later in um, June, I believe, and we're able to find chicks. And that's what we're able to see here. And to see this again, how uh, how do we see these uh, pictures? And and that and that is we were able to see them by, whoop, let's got too far. And there we are standing on the boardwalk of the interpretive center, looking out into that wetland. And that's where we're able to see, I'll go back, see these sites at Air Station Prairie. So there's more there uh, than what I've shown you. We have to move on, but I just wanted to give you an idea of, of stuff you can see in our neighborhood uh, in prairies and wetlands at Air Station Prairie. For lakes and streams, again, I did take uh, go to Lake Glenview, uh, which is, uh, you can park on Chestnut Avenue, uh, just west of the um, train station on Lehigh. And uh, um, it's, uh, and there's a, um, a paved sidewalk that uh, if you uh, have some um, mobility uh, issues, you can still get out and enjoy this area. There is a more naturalized trail a little bit closer to the lake, uh, which is a little bit hard to travel on um, if, you're, if you're not easily mobile. But nevertheless, you do have access to this. And again, I have pictures. I'm pretty good at taking pictures of birders. Uh, they don't, um, they're easy to identify. They don't move too quickly. So I, I, I'm better taking pictures of birders than I am of birds. Um, but I, I wanted to use these pictures to help illustrate, again, what people are carrying, what they're wearing, so that you can feel comfortable if you come out and, and go birding, what you should be, how you would feel comfortable as well. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're not looking at that. This is, these pictures were taken at Lake Glenview. Uh, these are all uh, mergansers. There's three kinds of mergansers, hooded common and red-breasted. These are red-breasted mergansers. And you can see that there's three of them and they're kind of doing a little bit of displaying. Again, it's springtime, it's a mating ritual. And you can see the one female here, here is not quite as colorful as the males who are really displaying. And that's, again, when you go birding, one part is just to see the birds, like, oh my God, there's a merganser. And then the second part is to actually uh, observe them and see their behavior, which can be very, very fun to see. And then just a close up of the merganser. They do eat fish, so you can see that really sawtooth uh, bill that they have where they can go. And these are, these are diving ducks. They will dive underneath the water. They will swim around, they'll find the fish um, and they'll catch them and they'll eat them. And uh, so that's, that's your merganser. Um, maybe not as uh, exciting as mergansers, but there's an island uh, there and uh, on the island are Canada goose, geese, and, um, and I've drawn the circle around some eggs that the, that the geese have laid. And they've just, they're just out there. And one of the reasons that they can just lay their eggs um, on this is that is that it's on an island, right? So they're pretty well protected from predators. Uh, so these, uh, these birds are not dumb. They know where they can go to, to lay their eggs, that they'll be protected. Other birds uh, that we see here, you'll see white birds flying by and uh, the casual observer will go, whoa, gulls. Nope, these are not gulls. These are Caspian terns. And I love terns. They're just a sharp looking, uh, you can see the wings of the bird in flight. And I love this picture because it's so urban. You got that house in the background. It's clearly Lake Glenview. And then you've got this, you know, un unusual, although not so unusual, uh, bird that you thought was a gull, but it's not a gull. It's a tern and it's got this coral red bill and the black cap. And, they, and these birds feed by hovering over the water and then they go die and they, they spot their prey and they do a straight dive from maybe 30, 40 feet up uh, into the water to catch their prey. Um, more often than not, they miss, but every once in a while they come up and then they fly away and you see them with a fish in their mouth. And again, I really like to see, I'm a big fan of what I call bird spectacle. 
Um, so that some people just like to identify the birds. I like to observe their behavior and I like to see um, uh, these kinds of, this kind of, uh, like their feeding behavior, their mating behavior, those kinds of things can be a lot of fun. And then this, uh, this last bird we've got here, um, and this is a cormorant. They look kind of like foreboding birds. You know, they hover, they're dark, and these are, again, fish eaters. Um, and the interesting, and again, this is Lake Glenview. Uh, and the fun thing about this bird is you'll see it's like, uh, um, looks like it's looking for applause there. It's like holding its uh, arms out. And the reason it does this is that unlike ducks, uh, um, cormorant's feathers are not waterproof. So if they want to be able to fly after they've been swimming around fishing, uh, they have to sit out in the sun and dry their feathers off. So again, this kind of uh, behavior, uh, sometimes if you can't see what the bird is, but you can see the behavior, you can identify the, the bird. And again, I did a little tight uh, photo of the uh, bill with that sharp beak, which allows them to, um, um, which allows them to catch their fish. I see some of the questions, but I'm gonna keep rolling here. We'll have time in a few moments to, to uh, address some of your questions here. Okay, let's go to the Grove. Uh, the Grove is the deep dark forest in Glenview. And uh, that's, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's on Milwaukee Avenue, um, just north of the TV on the opposite side of the street. And um, they've got mature oak forest. It's about 145 acres and it's dark. So we're gonna go kind of quickly through some of the birds. I wanna show you the habitat though first of it. Again, now we're in forest, unlike the open land areas of the lakes and the streams and the prairies and the fields, we're kind of in a darker forest. The pictures are darker. And so, um, so that makes taking pictures and seeing the bird a little bit more difficult. There is some nicely um, uh, 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 boardwalk that you can uh, roll around if you need to, or have access to the area that gives you access to the wetland area there, as well as to the forest there. So this is really uh, a great uh, facility. Um, one thing about that, uh, about um, birding, and that is, uh, as you see that this boardwalk is wet, um, yes, we will go birding in the rain. Um, the birds have to eat, uh, the birds are active. Sometimes the birds are more active in the rain than they are not. So weather is not necessarily, except dangerous weather, of course, um, lightning storms, we don't go out. But you know, just rain itself, if we can get out there, uh, sometimes that can be yield some of the best bird watching. Uh, so it helps to have, and you'll see that uh, one of the people here has their boots on, their calf, up to the calf, because they're prepared not just for the bird boardwalk, but for some of the paths. So it's a, it's a closed in forest and therefore, as I mentioned a moment ago, it can be very difficult because of the foliage to makes it difficult to see the birds. So um, sometimes even the very bright birds like the um, scarlet tanager uh, is, can be, you think, God, a bright red bird in the forest, that's easy to see. It may be difficult to see. Uh, so, um, for those of you, I, I want to talk just a moment about the other way we look for birds, and that is not just through what they look like, but what they sound like. So I'm going to play for you, if this works. So uh, we, we, some people call that a robin with a sore throat. Um, they listen for that and listening for the bird, sometimes it is, uh, is, uh, gives us an idea that that bird is actually in the forest when we can't otherwise see it. So birding by ear becomes particularly in uh, areas where visibility is obscured, such as forested areas when it gets really leafed out um, is a very important way to begin to go birding. People who have, um, um, play musical instruments, people who are musical tend to be much better at uh, uh, picking these sounds out in the forest. Uh, and they're a little more attuned to these, to these sounds. Um, 
So if you have that skill, you've got an advantage when it comes to doing uh, birding by ear. And again, I, that insect at the lower picture is the same bird. It's also a scarlet tanager. Uh, no, you're not colorblind. Um, that is a yellow bird because that is the female version of the, uh, of the scarlet tanager. So again, you can see a bird. If you don't see it in the context of the, of the, of the red bird, um, you'll have an idea, but you can see that the beak is the same beak. You can see that the black and the, and the wings are still there, but it's yellow instead of red, but it is in fact the scarlet tanager. So that just adds some of the fun to and challenge uh, to um, birding. And then of course, here we are at the grove and this doesn't, bird doesn't belong here at all. So don't get fooled by um, an introduced species. This is a peafowl, it's probably somebody's pet. And I was just wandering around on the grounds and I thought I'd share it because you're out in, particularly when we're out in our local urban areas, uh, you may find birds that are introduced and are somebody's pet that's just wandering around with the other birds. And you'll think you'll have discovered some exotic species, but you just discovered somebody's pet. Many of you may know this bird. Uh, this is the great blue heron. Uh, and again, this is a bird of wetlands. Uh, this bird is not injured. It does have two legs, but you only see that it's standing on one leg. Um, and that's very common. The bird will stand absolutely still in the water with one leg down, which looks like a, looks like a, um, a log uh, to a fish going by. And then the bird will use that scissor, that, that dangerous bill and, and just use it to skewer uh, the fish that it's looking at. Uh, but it'll stand still for, uh, I don't know how long. Uh, I don't wait along, around long enough to see how long it's actually standing still, but it'll stand still there for a long time. Um, but this is a dangerous bird. You know, you don't wanna approach these wild animals. This bird is uh, probably three, four feet tall and uh, and it, it, I have heard somebody refer to this as a, it's a pair of scissors on a spring with a brain. And, uh, you know, that, and think of it as, as that. This bird can extend that neck uh, out and um, really make a jab. That's how it catches its fish. You don't want to get near it. So very quickly, just going through some of the other forest birds. Uh, these are fly catchers. Um, they catch flies. And uh, they're fun to watch. Uh, because they fly off from the branch and then they return back to the branch. On the top, we have a great fly catcher. Um, it is a big fly catcher. And then at the very bottom right, we have the lesser fly catcher, which is a tiny fly catcher. And then a bird you may all know, um, but you don't know you know it, and that's the Phoebe. It's the Eastern Phoebe. And uh, I like birds like this because they say their name, Phoebe. Phoebe, Phoebe, and I like birds that, uh, you know, I like birds that say their name because it makes it easy for me to remember their name. Uh, it's as simple, yes, it is as simple as that. If the bird says its name, uh, it's a great bird as far as I'm concerned. So, but so these, these are some of the fly catchers that you can see at the grove. And uh, these are thrushes. And yes, that is a robin. And I included the robin. Robin was photographed at the grove. Um, but I want to show you the robin in context of the other thrushes that you might not be as familiar with. Um, they're all cousins in some form. Cousin might not be the right um, true family relationship, but basically they're of a common type and they're, they're all various kinds of thrushes. And again, um, we, we know the robin's call. You may not be able to identify it all the time, although now, when you see robins, particularly when they begin to sing in the spring, you should listen to them more carefully. But this robin will not sound like this thrush. So I'm gonna play this thrush because it is one of the most beautiful sounds in the forest. The mnemonic that we use for that sound is Eole, Eole, don't ask me to sing it. And it's just a, a melodic, flute-like sound. And you may not be able to ever see this bird, um, but you can hear this bird. And when you hear it, it is just absolutely, you know, 
that spring is here. It is truly a wonderful bird, again, related to the, um, to the American robin. And then quickly, um, warblers are definitely uh, the high point for everybody in the springtime. Uh, these are tiny pictures in the upper. We have a yellow rumped warbler. Uh, again, it's got a little yellow. You can maybe see in the thumb there, uh, hence the name. Um, you have a palm warbler, this guy with a little brown cap and a little yellow bib. And then over on the right here, we have a chestnut sided warbler. Uh, because it's got a chestnut side. Um, so they often use descriptive names, but not always for the birds. Uh, there's about 30 warbler species. They come through in the springtime. They come back through in the fall and um, they're really a delight to see and they're definitely inhabit uh, the, uh, the grove. Great place to see them. And then um, sparrows, um, often called LBJs or little brown jobs. Uh, a lot of people, me included for years, didn't really care much for sparrows. I thought of sparrows as your basic house sparrow. Now, but these birds are actually, this one at the top here is a fox sparrow. And it's just, it's a big bulky bird. And uh, it's got these wonderful stripes on it. And in the lower left, these are the same two bird. I didn't think the right picture brought it out as much. So I went and found this one, um, which highlighted a little more, because he's got, this is a swamp sparrow. And uh, the swamp sparrow will in fact be in a wetlands and it's got some nice red along its side. So sparrows are not your common, again, house sparrow. The house sparrow is an introduced species. It was actually introduced in New York City, uh, I think in the early 19th century. Um, uh, 20th century, I believe. And in an effort to control a troublesome moth, and uh, that didn't really work. The, the, the bird became uh, an urban bird. It's all over the United States. In fact, it's all over the world. Um, so house sparrows kind of put me off of sparrows. Don't let it put you off of sparrows. There are some wonderful birds uh, that are sparrows. Okay, so we're gonna move on from birds now. Uh, we've now covered um, the three areas, four areas that I wanted to talk about in terms of habitat. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, getting the help you need to become a better birder and building a community. Um, this has really just been an introduction. I didn't expect you to be taking notes, just getting a feeling for what is out there and understanding that there are things out there. Um, but if you have an interest, where do you go from here? And so one of the first things is I mentioned field guides. There's a number of print field guides. Uh, you should literally, um, go online or go to a real bookstore that, uh, uh, that has field guides and look through them. Uh, field guides tend to show you not only what the bird looks like as the picture shows, but it shows you where the bird will be in various times of the year, which is very important because if you see a bird and it's the wrong time of the year, that's probably not the bird that you thought it was. The field guide also tells you where it geographically hangs out and what time of year it hangs out there. So these kinds of things give you good uh, direction to help you identify the birds. So print field guides are, um, are valuable for a lot of people. Um, I, again, you don't have to be limited to one. Uh, any one of them is a good start. Uh, I probably have about 10. And uh, the other thing that has developed, of course, in the last 10 years are digital field guides. And one of the advantages of the digital field guides, we talked a little bit about birding by ear, a lot of the digital field guides actually have uh, not only show the bird, show pictures, show the geography, but they also have sounds, uh, play the sounds of the birds. So you can actually hear the bird. Um, and if you identify something in the field and wonder if that's what you heard, you can make a guess, find the bird in your digital field guide. When I say digital, of course, I mean on your, on your um, mobile device. And, um, and many of these guides are, are free or some of them are at, at any rate, they're really pretty inexpensive. So there's a number of tools that you can have. And of course I said something about birding by ear. So I can't not um, tell you that there are uh, um, digital and CDs available. Um, and uh, if you want to really annoy your significant other or spouse, it's a great way thing to do and play in the car. My wife does it all the time. It makes me absolutely crazy, but she learns the bird sounds I don't. 
And um, so if you do want to learn bird sounds, it is a very important part of birding. Uh, you know, getting hold of and learning to bird by ear is can be really a very, really extend the, um, uh, your ability to identify birds and, and your enjoyment of the birding environment. And the last thing we'll talk about here about um, resources, and that is, and I saw one of the questions about birding um, field trips, is of course the birding community. Um, learning from others is, is absolutely the best way to um, become a better birder and enjoy it uh, and get up to speed quickly. Uh, of course, you will wind up building friendships. Uh, you'll become aware of some of the issues that, and we'll talk about those, we'll finish with talking about those for a moment. So being part of a birding community can be very valuable. And uh, some of the birding communities, uh, we do uh, are like Illinois Audubon Society, of which I'm involved with, with Lake Cook Chapter, um, the National Audubon Society, there's the Chicago Audubon, um, there's the Evanston North Shore Bird Club, which is not affiliated with any larger group, it's an independent organization, and, you know, we're cool. I mean, we drink beer, we have fun. Uh, there I am in, in the lower picture, in the lower left, raising my hand and waving hi. Um, so we're, you know, we're out eating and talking about birds and other things. Uh, but the community is really a good place um, to relate to and go out on communal field trips. And let me just close with this last issue thing. And that is, um, birds are at risk. Um, you almost can't open the newspaper or find something online where you're not learning about um, um, threats to birds. So what I want to do is not belabor it. I really want to talk about three things that are threatening birds. Uh, number one, of course, is habitat loss. Um, we, this whole presentation was about habitat. We talked about the lakes and streams and the woods and whatever. Um, if you have less of those areas, you have less birds, fewer birds that can live in them. Uh, so this is a really uh, good reason that we should support our park districts and our forest preserves. Uh, and the key word in forest preserves is preserve. And, um, and we work with them also to try and make sure that as part of their preserving um, is not only environments for birds, but also for uh, uh, plants and flowers and dragonflies and whatever there is in nature, of course. So habitat loss is one of the biggest risks to birds. Outdoor cats uh, is one of my personal things. It's very political. I won't get into it here. Um, but of course, uh, feral cat control and even personal pet management. Um, 50, 60 years ago was really pretty common uh, to let our cats outside. Uh, people still do that. Uh, cats are natural born killers and Collectively, between feral cats and outdoor cats, um, outdoor cats kill uh, over a billion, that's with a B, uh, birds a year. And this absolutely has an impact on the overall health and well being of the birds. And then window collisions. I actually started when I was talking about backyard birding and told you how I had moved my own um, bird feeder so birds wouldn't collide with the window. But um, you can take those kinds of moves, but also there's other things more institutionally that can be done. And that is there's, um, there's bird friendly building design uh, that has to do with um, uh, windows that, uh, uh, that birds can actually see uh, because there is a very light grain in the window that we cannot perceive, doesn't affect light, uh, but does, in fact, does let the bird avoid the building. Uh, and then, of course, uh, what you can do on an individual basis is things like drawing your window shades uh, during the migration. It's a time, it's spring, you want to let the sun in, you want it to be bright. And what I'm suggesting is that uh, maybe during the mornings and certainly overnight, you actually draw those window shades um, so that the birds will not fly into those windows. Um, so those are, you know, just, and that's just a, that's just the beginning. So I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to emphasize that you should get outside, go birding. I know it's January. We've been having some really decent weather, but uh, the birds are in fact out there. There's not, you know, not as many now as there will be. So this presentation in, in mid-January is a good uh, prelude 
to for you to begin getting yourself out by the end of March. Uh, as soon as the our lakes begin to unfreeze, the ducks will begin to come in. And then there's other things in April, the migratory birds will begin to come through all through May. And, and then it just goes from there. So um, get outside, go birding. Thanks very much for watching. I'd be happy to talk to you about any questions you may have. All right, thank you. I'm gonna um, unmute people. Um, let's see here. So you can now unmute yourselves if you wanna ask a question. Uh, or you should be able to at least. We had one question about um, what types of birds stay in this area during the winter? Um, two things, not only stay, but actually come here. We are actually, so let me answer it quickly. Blue jays, chickadees, um, uh, um, our cardinals, I was just looking out the backyard now against the snow, those red cardinals are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and of course, American goldfinch, they're not bright yellow and black, they're more drabber, but those are common. And this year we're actually having a finch, the word is eruption, I-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N. We're actually having birds that because of a um, crop, Failure, I think it is, up north. They're moved south in the search of food. And uh, so we're seeing a lot of unusual finches uh, in this uh, in this in this area that we don't normally see. But for the common bird, um, certainly uh, that we have our winter finches that are here, uh, house finches, those red guys, kind of red breast, and the goldfinch, blue jays. Chickadees, I love chickadees. Another bird that says its name. Chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. I hear them all the time. How about juncos? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the primer. Juncos, I love juncos. You know, and we all groan when we see a junco come in uh, the fall because it tells us that winter's going to be here. And then we wave goodbye to them uh, when they leave in in uh, April and May. Uh, they are just uh, those are sparrows. Juncos are sparrows and they are dark on top and white underneath. And when you see those birds at the, bottom, at, at the foot of your feeder, just kind of pecking away at things uh, mm -hmm. against the snow, they're just, they're just great to see. Thanks for that. Sure. Uh, let's see, there was one more question about- Oh yeah, somebody said hawks. So yeah, oh. certainly uh, <laughs> raptors as a category uh, are here all year. Uh, um, eagles, you know, along the Illinois River, not so much in Glenview, Although they are around here, we do have uh, bald eagles flying by um, all the time, honestly, particularly along the lakefront. Um, but bald eagles are around and that's a raptor. And then a number of different, the red-tailed hawks are driving down Eden's Expressway. You look up at one of the lights and you see this big bird looking down at you, it's probably a red-tailed hawk. I know we have great horned owls even in uh, in my neighborhood in Skokie because I hear them hear them outside my window. I almost stuck a slide in. I had a great. Uh, I hear them. They're right around my house, um, and I and I hear them. Particularly, the, uh, mating season for those birds is is right now, uh, so they're looking for mates and they're going whoop 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 whoop. So we also had a question about a camera recommendation. I'm not one to give a camera recommendation. I um I took move my camera. I have uh, um you a lot of the pictures that you saw they're not particularly great, but you know I I I and I said I take pictures of people. Um, I'm not the one to take a, to make camera recommendations. I have a Panasonic camera with about um, uh, eight twelve power, and that's about what I use. But um, I know some people get really uh, with cameras. There are, there, there are a pair of nesting eagles at uh, in Bussy Woods. You know, I'll tell you. Uh, I think there's about nine uh, um, eagle nests in the region. Um, people are always letting us uh, our, through the website, our Lake Cook website, know along uh, I-90. There's a there's an eagle nest. So yes, I I wouldn't question that there are uh, eagle nests uh, in Bussy Woods. Rosalyn, you had a question? 
You have your oh, hand did up. you say? Did you say Rosalind? Yes. I wanted yeah. to know if um, Sonny had an email address that he would share with us. For me, yes. It's uh, it's uh, Sonny S O N N Y uh, at Lake Cook Audubon uh, dot org. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I should have put that up there. Let's see. Any other questions? Well, <laughs> and if, if, if that doesn't work or if you don't get me, you can go to the lakecookaudubon.org website and there's a contact form. And I do, in fact, I am the one who actually receives those, those emails. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Stores that have a good selection of binoculars. Um, you know, I'll tell you, um, there was a store in, uh, in, in outside Madison, Wisconsin, that was the go-to store for every birder and they closed. I don't, so right now I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, there, there, Question Techni, about Basin. What? Techni Basin is another just north of um, Willow Road uh, and south of Willow Road uh, is another good place for birding. Yeah, we had a question about whether this will be posted somewhere and we are going to have it posted on the library's YouTube. So look for it there in a few days. <laughs> KT asks, do you feed birds in the summer with the exception of hummingbirds and orioles? What was the first part of the question? Uh, do you feed birds in the summer with the exception of hum hummingbirds and orioles? I, I think you feed them all the time, right? Uh, yeah, again, uh, uh, you feed them when you want to attract them. Uh, I tend to feed them a little bit less in the summer uh, because, and when I'm talking about summer, I mean after migration, uh, which is basically around June one, because then we have our resident species. Uh, we're back, uh, and it, again, we're back to cardinals and blue jays uh, and um, and goldfinches. But I, I do like to feed them. I, li I like to bring them into the yard. Um, but uh, uh, I, I'm actually heavily into feeding the birds right now in January to see. I'm trying to bring in some of those er eruptive um, finches that I just mentioned. I have not been successful yet, um, but uh, yeah, uh, springtime though, and is really tell you get yourself in gear so that you can really be uh, feeding because that's when you're going to get your uh, feeding in spring because that's when you're going to get your Baltimore Orioles put out some fruit. Uh, they love they love oranges uh, and things like that. You can find that information pretty much online. You get those field guides; it'll tell you this stuff as well. But yeah, I feed the birds, I feed the birds, again, I feed, I emphasize when I say feed, I mean attract, but I feed the birds um, throughout the year. Uh, I probably have a budget of about $150 that I spend on um, bird seed. All right, any other questions? Well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Sonny. That was a great presentation. Oh, good. I hope you enjoyed <laughs> it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that was useful. And um, thank you very much for taking a moment, uh, uh, part of the evening, get away from the strangeness out there right now and come enjoy the calmness of birds and uh, natural environment. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.